Welcome to all of you, you're watching Tech 24, I'm Julia Seeger. In this edition, after the Christchurch massacre in New Zealand was live streamed in 2019, tech giants decided to hire human moderators to identify shocking and hateful footage. In our upcoming report, we tell you about the men and women who have taken up the dirty work of cleaning up the internet. And in Test 24, we tried the Clean Box. As its name suggests, it's a box that sanitizes all your devices in the blink of an eye using UV sterilization. Now, following the 17-minute live stream of a terrorist attack on two New Zealand mosques in March 2019, tech giants were forced to act. Their slow response in taking down the footage of the massacre from their platforms sparked outrage throughout the world. And one way they found to make the internet a safer place was to put humans back at the heart of the machine. But who are the people who now perform the job of trying to clean the internet? Our reporters have the story. There are tens of thousands of them around the world. Internet moderators trawl through the web's most obscene and violent content for hours on end to decide what needs to be masked or taken down. Many of them work for Twitter or Facebook in Manila in the Philippines. They're contractually forbidden to disclose what they do, but some have spoken out anonymously. Pornography, violence, we thoroughly review every post. Different sites have different sets of strict criteria. If it's the video is focusing on the area of the of genitalia and all, um, that's violating the policies. It's become uh, removable. When it comes to art, even though if there is um, seeing a private, private part of your body, well, it's really outside the policy of Facebook, so it will remove. They have to watch around 100 videos a day and can't stop even when the scenes of violence are unbearable. The one that I really struck me. Uh, it's a gang. Um, they beheaded the, the guy and they filming it. And You'll see the guy staring at the camera. I kind of think that the guy who is behead, beheaded is looking at me. The effect on their mental health is often serious. These two men had to quit after a year, unable to continue. I kind of slightly think of doing suicide, but, but not really doing it. I'm still in my mind that uh, I don't want to, to die just like that. If you will see the violence, it's actually your body can absorb it, your mind can absorb it, and it's really depressing. The moderators have psychological support, but only for 15 to 20 minutes a month. On average, they earn around 100 euros a week. They're not employed directly by the companies whose sites they're cleaning up, but by subcontractors who refuse to give interviews. For several months, this Washington Post journalist has been investigating the world of internet moderation. It's an opaque industry where employees are often left to their fates. They're definitely more vulnerable in the Philippines, especially um, because of labor laws here, um, or because of uh, mental health is a big stigma in, in the Philippines. Um, it's not really, it's something that people here still have to grapple with. The work done by moderators is, however, essential to protect the almost 4 billion social media users across the world. And I'm now joined in the studio by our in-house expert, Dan Ajay Kadokar. Hello, Dan. Hello, Julia. We just saw how difficult it is for people to moderate content online. I guess the question we all have in mind today is, can artificial intelligence replace humans in this particular task? Well, before answering that, I must make a mention of a documentary and a book that touches upon different aspects of this profession. The documentary is called The Cleaners. It's made by two German filmmakers. And the book is called Behind the Screen. So if you want to know more about how and uh, uh, 
how basically this work is done, you can refer to these uh, two sources. Now, coming to the question of AI, yes, more and more companies are using AI tools such as image recognition to do the uh, work of content moderation. Uh, they have had success in, um, in many aspects, but there are certain fields such as cyberbullying or hate speeches that still need human intervention. That's because unless and until AI develops the power of contextual understanding, uh, we'll still need uh, human content moderation. It seems like we're not quite there yet. Thank you very much, Dan and Jake Haddelkar. Now, she's been nominated as one of the most influential women in the Bay Area in 2020 by the San Francisco Business Times. Whitney Bauck is the COO of HelloSign, a leading e-signature provider recently launched in 21 additional languages. The service enables companies to replace traditional pen and paper with a secure online solution so that agreements can be executed more quickly. Well, to speak more about it, I'm joined by Whitney Bauck. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Julie. I'm thrilled to be here talking to you today. Now, Whitney, the COVID-19 pandemic has really shed light on the importance of such a tool, hasn't it? It really has. We have seen growing adoption anyway pre-COVID. In fact, Europe has seen the highest rate of increase and uptake of e-signature in the last several years. Uh, we've seen somewhere between two to four times the volume of e-signature requests out of Europe. And interestingly, France has been the highest in Europe, growing more than four times over the past three years. But COVID has certainly shed a new light on the need for businesses to be able to do things electronically and not be in the same room. So pen and paper signatures just aren't feasible. Um, so just in the last couple of months since the shelter in place and remote work orders have gone into place, we've seen three times the volume of e-signature requests over prior months. So that's a dramatic increase that is clearly related to COVID and businesses really moving faster to digitize and modernize the processes that involve business critical document transactions. Now Whitney, how can e-signatures actually boost businesses globally and help them increase their competitive advantage? Well, e-signature is a way to accelerate the processes around signing business critical documents and agreements. And the faster you can get that done, obviously the faster revenue comes into play. So this is really all about speed to revenue. Um, we do also see much greater benefits in accuracy. We see better benefits in user experience. And of course, we know that there are lost revenues due to poor transaction management. In fact, Forrester Research estimates that up to 25% of revenue can be lost due to poor transaction management, which is a very high number, obviously. So this is a way for companies to really be faster, to be more lucrative, and to provide a better and safer and more secure experience for their customers. Now, an e-signature platform like HelloSign has to deal, of course, with confidential and even sensitive information. So how do you ensure the security of the data from a cybersecurity point of view? Yeah, great question. And security obviously is paramount when we're dealing with business critical documents. Funny enough, paper, although perceived to be relatively safe, is actually not secure at all. It can be damaged, it can be stolen, it can be lost. Um, whereas when we're talking about electronic signature, we have ways to really ensure high levels of security. So for one example, um, with HelloSign, every single step of an e-signature process is tracked recorded and audited, and it is stored in a secure and encrypted audit trail that can be used for legal defensibility if ever a contract's validity is questioned. We also encrypt everything as part of the process, both at rest and in transit, uh, using the transport layer security encryption technology. And we also ensure that we go through a whole bunch of compliance capabilities and certifications to ensure that we comply not only with security standards like ISO 27001, which is a global security standard, but also regional laws um, that pertain to e-signatures validity specifically. So in Europe, that includes things like, of course, EITIS, which is unique to e-signature, but also things like GDPR to make sure that we protect people's information properly. Whitney Bauke, it was a pleasure to have you on the show this week. Julia, thank you so much for having me, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. And it's time now for Test 24.
the wake of COVID-19, we're seeing more and more solution to disinfect devices. And on the set of Test24 alone, we've already tested one. So Dan, what exactly is different with this clean box? Well, first of all, it's bigger. So it uh, can clean objects that are bigger in size compared to what we had uh, a few months ago. Uh, this, is, this particular box caters mainly to headsets. So it could be VR headsets. They're just one uh, VR headset inside the box right now. It could also be your audio headsets. Now, as you mentioned, uh, uh, as in the previous box, it's a similar technology. It uses the ultraviolet C light in order to disinfect these headsets. It can kill up to 99.99% of uh, bacteria, viruses, and other pathogens. And it also has a blower that uh, blows simultaneously when the UV light uh, is uh, in action. And it helps to keep the headset dry, which is also very important. Now, this uh, particular clean box has been brought to France by VR Academy, and it's aimed mostly at uh, uh, museums, for example, where you have virtual reality tours, but it's very difficult to sanitize all these headsets in quick time because this box can sanitize a headset in just 60 seconds. Thank you very much, Dan and Jake Hadelkar there. That brings us to the end of this week's edition of Tech24. You can watch it again on our website, france24.com. See you soon. Thank you.